What's up, everybody? It is not Monday, but it's Wednesday, but we're still here for Master Motivation. My guest today is the one, the only, Mr. Blake Foster. What's up, buddy? What's going on? What's up, dude? How are you? Dude, I'm so stoked. I think this is going to be super fun. Um, I, I know there's going to be a lot of people that watch this uh, either live or watch this later and just get a real kick out of hearing uh, you know, a little bit more of your backstory. So right. uh, happy, to, happy to have you on the show. Now, I want to just kind of start this off by um, letting you know something that I don't know if you ever even knew this. I, I did comment on a on a, it was your mom or dad's Facebook post, something that, you know, they're so proud of you always posting everything. Yeah. And one of the things, you know, the very first time that I met you was at a tournament. I, I don't know if you were six, five, six years old, but um, I used to go to the tournaments with a friend, Marcus Brown. I don't know if you remember Marcus, but um, he Sounds trained familiar. at Tom, trained at Tom Bloom studio. And I would go to these tournaments and, and, you know, our school wasn't a big tournament school. We just didn't go, but right. your mom and dad were always there watching me and cheering me on. It was yep. so cool. And I, and I just can remember that from, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, yeah. that, that they were always at the tournaments and cheering me on. And so always. that's when I first met you. And then, uh, I'm going to let you tell your story a little bit, but I know, you know, you trained with Tom Bloom and, and now you train with Mr. Cox and we got a lot to talk about. So yeah. where, where do you, where do you I'm want to start? I'm glad to be here. I mean, I mean, yeah, you're right though, man. My parents got me started in martial arts really young. I think I was in a playpen at Sherman Oaks karate when I was three years old. Um, oh, yeah. And I started my, my training under Bernie Krasno. Pop, everybody knows him as pops. Um, I trained with them up until I was probably around six, seven years old. And then, my mom and dad got me started in, you know, point fighting com uh, tournaments and doing forms and stuff like that. I did weapons. Uh, I competed. I did a lot of tournaments. And then I was at the internationals one time and I was sparring and <laughs> I was taking out every kid in the division. And t Mr. Bloom was there and he had a he had a big guy. His name was Buck Ramsey. And he was like the man to beat and he came up to me. He's like, I hope you I hope you're ready for my 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 student because you're not going to beat him. And um, I swept the floor with him. <laughs> I beat him up. I won first place at the Long Beach Internationals. And then uh, he was just in shock. And he was like, he came up to my mom and dad. And he was like, I would love to have Blake come and start taking some classes up in, at my studio in Agora. So my parents were so into the martial arts. They literally took me from studio to studio. I was literally training everywhere. And I even trained with Mr. Cox back when I was around nine, 10 years old. Just going there because we had a Team USA, me, Stefan Rubenfeld, and his uh, cousin Randy. And we would do point fighting and we'd go around these tournaments. And I was fighting at a bunch of different studios. Um, got my black belt. Actually, I tested for my black belt in 1997. I was 12 years old and I failed my black belt test. Tom said, you know, I'm just, you're, you're better than what I saw and I want you to retake it. And as a 12 year old, it was devastating. I went home, I cried, didn't want to go back to karate. But he told me something that resonated with me and it stuck with me throughout my adult my adulthood. And it uh, you know, it only made me a stronger person as a kid to be able to go through something like that and stick with it. So I got my black belt, I tested the second time, got my black belt at the age of 12, went on to do, you know, films, and I was still acting in the time. So my childhood was very, very far fetched from anything normal. Um, I was homeschooled a lot and I traveled to movie sets and different auditions. I would go on four or five auditions a day. And then my mom and dad still had it in them to take me to karate at the end of the night. And I would end my night doing karate homework in them. They were training and that's, that's my, that's my life. That's what I've been doing this whole time. So yeah. yep, yep, um, yep. I, I ran into Mr. Cox. I, I got a little older. I had some kids and met Mr. Cox. So I ran into the, went into chats with karate and I was just in shock with the way that the studio was run. I was like, this is where my son needs to be. This is, I grew up in a Tong Sudo studio. I want my son to be in a Tong, Tong Sudo studio. So one thing led to another and I became a part of the Alliance for Chatsworth. Got to meet all you guys. And, um, recently last year tested for my fourth degree, got my master's belt under him and it felt good. And then <laughs> this fight thing finally picked up. So one thing has just been leading to another for me, and I think the the main thing is the foundation of the martial arts that I'm so um, in tune with. So, yeah, well, I, you know, I know that your parents are you know longtime martial artists and and a huge part of Sherman Oaks Karate. As a matter of fact, you know, your mom often talks about starting with with my instructor Dennis Ichikawa and, and training with him back in the day. Um, I wasn't really aware. I didn't know that you trained at at Sherman Oaks initially. I always remember you being, you know, kind of more aligned with with Tom's school. Yeah, and, Pops would and, always be like, "Oh, Blake the Flake." 
Oh. Like the flakes here. <laughs> he would always mess oh. with me. Oh, that's but yeah, funny. I think I got all the way up to blue belt with Pops. Okay, and and you brought up Stefan Rubenfeld. That's not a that's a name that man I haven't uh, I haven't heard in quite a while. Uh, and I still talk to him. I still yeah, talk he, to him and his cousin Randy. Oh wow, you know. So I remember uh, his dad started. What was it? Was it TKO or um, the the brand that he started with the the equipment back yeah, then? I remember everybody carrying the big old bags. Yeah, yep. and uh, yeah, and Stefan actually started at Tarzana Karate, uh, if I remember correctly. And then, you know, he started working out with Butch and, and he got all into the, the yep. weapons and then, yep. yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, with, with our circle, there's a lot of, you know, intertwined I call uh, it the training, web. The, the web, web, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. Well, it yeah. was even, uh, I was on my way leaving Chatsworth Karate to go to ASE to get belts or whatever. And I'm stopped at the gas station and there you are. <laughs> and we just like, we just hit it up like, Hey, what's up? And, and you were telling me about, you know, your son's training over with Mr. Cox. So, you know, uh, what tournament stuff, you know, what do you really remember is like, the, you know, the, the good times and what do you remember, um, yeah. competing it's all over? Kids, it's funny because acting in the martial arts was two different things that I had to separate. When I was on set, I had to be the actor. When I was in the studio, I had to be the student. And uh, I don't really remember too much of the acting because it was so fun for me. Karate, I remember everything of because I was so disciplined. I was in tune. I knew what I was doing. I had to go to the tournament. I had to fight. Um, and I had to spar. And I had to take trophies home and stuff like that. So it was something more or less that I, I've always been good at what I do. And I don't want to settle for second place or third place, place. So I would always train my butt off to make sure I went in there and I took home first. But everything I remember, I mean, I'm sitting here in front of all my trophies and stuff. I got world champions in Las Vegas, multiple stuff. You said the B-52 fight, uh, the demo team that I was oh, on. Yeah. We used to travel. And I mean, that was one thing that I really, really enjoyed as a martial artist. And I don't see too much of it now because obviously we had COVID last year and stuff like that. But even before COVID, there was not a lot of uh, outer, not inner school tournaments, but more of the outer school tournaments where you would travel to such a big place because like Vegas was one of the biggest ones for me. We right. would get to go to Vegas. They had big light up trophies for first place and just being with the whole studio and the team. And like, I'm experiencing it now because since I've been doing the MMA stuff, um, I'm so into this MMA gym and I'm dedicating all my time and everything over there. Jackson's with me. So Jackson's been doing a lot of jujitsu over there. And he's actually competing in Jiu-Jitsu World League for his first tournament. And it's a huge tournament. So it's kind of crazy how full circle is going around for me as a father now to see what my parents experienced as far as oh, taking yeah. me to a tournament and doing this stuff. And Jackson's pumped, man. He's a four-stripe in Jiu-Jitsu. He's really good. He's been taking wrestling over at Shamnod. So just keeping him busy along with me staying busy because I'm over there so much. I'm like, dude, I don't have – time to take him over to Mr. Cox right now. I don't have time to take him to another studio because I'm putting in endless amount of hours, jujitsu, nogi, uh, kickboxing, Muay Thai, boxing, everything. So I'm prepared for this fight come September. Um, Cause like I said, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do the best that I can. I know what I can bring to the table. So it's just crazy how the world works and how fast everything shifts. And especially as, coming from a Tong Sudo lineage to a MMA stuff and how, cool my style can transit transition into it so well fortunately for us you know we've been in and around a lot of different martial artists that were open to the idea of incorporating jujitsu and boxing and, right. and muay thai right because you know a traditional school typically wouldn't have all exactly. those things i can remember a lot of know, schools at, don't have that anymore right so, you know, just being exposed and, and it kind of tells you that, you know, like you said, you, you knew you had to take your son to Mr. Cox because that was the place to train because immediately they, they, have, they have everything, right? Yeah, they I the love the way that not even the, what they had to offer, but the way that they structured their curriculum, the way that they were set up and we are what they say at the end, you know, we're black belt, sir. And like the way that they right. were in tune with stuff, it reminded me of my childhood and how strict it was in the dojo for us not to move in Chumbi, you know? Right. So right. I just, yeah, it's crazy, man. I'm, I'm, I'm having, I've really, I told my mom that I don't think I'll ever do a fight after this one, but honestly I've fell in love with it and I'm probably going to do a couple other fights. Nice. So we'll yeah. see. We'll see how it that's, goes. But that's super cool. Well, before we get talking about that fight, and yeah, uh, we'll, we'll we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you know, some of the, one of the other guys that I remember who was uh, who who trained with you or trained, you know, B fifty twos. Thinking of that team, uh, Steve Tarada. 
You still yeah. keep in touch with Steve? Yeah, I do actually. Steve's a good buddy of mine. He's super excited for the fight. We talk to each other all the time. Um, I think it was last year Tom retired and he gave up the keys to the dojo and he just called it, you know, he he he, he said I'm done. So right. we all went out there for a big family reunion. He, we all signed his last and final gi and um man, it was it was awesome. We got, we, it was memories that I'll cherish and I'll hold on to forever because those are the people that I grew up with. So yeah, yeah we'll talk to Steven. He's still really good at martial arts. He still does his uh, crazy flips and he was a man. His forms were phenomenal. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's funny because um, Steven used to actually, uh, we did like, we, we would do a tournament or something and then we would do like a custom form and Steven and me did like some custom Power Ranger sequence stuff together. Quite a few right. times, we both had the same hair at the time. So <laughs> it was just funny. Yeah, I mean, he even he he went on to to be part of the part of a dance crew that you know they were on America's Got Talent, and he, he, he really really took off with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I, and I remember hearing about Tom's uh, going away party, so to speak. And, uh, you know, that's where, again, my one of my best friends, Marcus Brown, he was there. Tony Onesto, Phil Tony. McGrath, uh, yep. you know, I mean, all these guys. These are all the it's guys. Funny, I actually just saw up. Phil. Phil has a studio off of Las Virginis. Does he really? Yeah, I just saw Phil and uh, Mr. Bloom came and said hi. And Mr. Bloom actually teaches, you know, he has still students that were going for black belt that he still sits and teaches there. So. Right. It's good to see him in the studio, and I took Jackson for a class, and he was like, oh, man, Jackson's so big. I can't believe how big he is, and time flies. And my That's daughter's nice. three. She's going to end up starting taking little dragons. As soon as this fight stuff's over, I'm going to get back in the studio over there because um, I kind of feel like I haven't had the time to be able to do anything. So I want to get Olivia started. Olivia's three, going to be three in August, and she's just ready to throw punches. She's walking around kicking Jackson saying, ah, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'm seeing it turn full circle on me at, at 36. A hundred percent. No, I get it. And I, I'm sure, you know, I have a son who's, he's 16 years old and I've watched him train since he was three. And, uh, you know, he has aspirations of doing some fights. He likes to go out and train Heck with John yeah. Hackleman at the pit and he's, nice. uh, he's a high level wrestler. So yeah, it does. It does come full circle. It's kind of cool to live a little bit vicariously through them because, right. you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. So you don't, you won't see me at a tournament or in the cage anytime soon. <laughs> you, might find me, you might find me in a pro wrestling ring. Soon I just later. saw that. I didn't know you get down like that. Oh man, man. That's well, awesome. Yeah. You know, traveling I've, and doing comic cons. I, like I was telling you earlier, I met a lot of wrestlers and I, lo I met a lot of pro amateur, amateur fighters and wrestlers and stuff in the, um, in the wrestling world. And uh, I grew up a huge wrestling fan, so it was like I'm like still fangirling sometimes when I meet like Hulk Hogan or like I told you uh, Kevin Nash from the NWO. Totally. But I see a lot of these things, and they're like, dude, that is actually a huge thing. This amateur wrestling is huge. The community yeah. they well, have, and everybody, it's probably like martial arts. Everybody knows everybody. Oh, in the independent wrestling in the SoCal scene is, is pretty nuts. And uh, so, you know, just on that uh, MPW, Millennium Pro Wrestling is actually uh, their school is in Chatsworth, not far from uh, where Mr. Cox's school is. So wow. and that's, you know, that's where I started training. We moved to school out here in Moore Park for a bit and then moved back. Uh, but yeah, the independent wrestling scene is pretty neat. It's pretty cool. We've had some uh, some high level people that have been, you know, in our school and teaching in our school. Um so anyway, if you want to go check out my YouTube channel, I there got a go. YouTube Plug channel it. with all my pro wrestling, uh, check it out. But uh, what was it like to test for fourth degree? You know, coming back off kind of a hiatus um, and getting back in, going for a, a real high level. Because in our system, fourth degree is considered a master uh, in Tong Shido. So what was that like, you know, coming off of, you know, a little hiatus and going into that? You know, it was a lot different because I got my fourth degree through Tom. So okay. when I when I was over talking to Mr. Cox and stuff, he was like, well, what we were talking about forms. And I, I think we stopped because we did like some custom forms. You know, Tom was always flashy. So right. we stopped like at Naichi Chodon or Naichi Edon, the last one. And right. I don't remember too many forms up until after there. We didn't really learn anything else. Maybe Chipsu or Sechente. But um, when I was talking to Mr. Cox about it and I was like, you know, I really want to sit on Jackson's black belt panel. And he was like, well, in order to do that, you have to be a fourth degree under me, sir. And I was like, well, then what do, I'm going to take my, I'm going to take my test. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and everybody thought, oh, Blake, the flake's not going to do it. And then I buckled down and I learned all the rest of the forms, all the weapons forms. And I tested and it was literally, it took me a year to get everything down. And I was doing private lessons with Miss Ashley Sage and I was doing privates with Mr. Ichikawa and 
training with Mr. Kimmer and just going through every day, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, black belt class. And it literally brought me back to realize that martial arts is my foundation and that's what I truly enjoy. And I think that's what kind of transitioned the fight thing too, is because I was just in the, the, the dojo, I was training again. And um, it feels really good, man. It feels good to actually have something accomplished. I have a, I have my plaque sitting right here from Chats with Karate uh, in a, an award for three black belt. So it just, it's just another pedestal that I'd like to climb abo above and beyond. And I, I was humbled at the same time because everybody didn't think I was going to do it. And I did it and it felt great. It was very, it was very humbling. That's awesome. Well, congratulations again. I, I, I appreciate I heard it. You had a great performance. Sorry, I couldn't be there. It's but, okay. uh, you know, hey, uh, I'm, I'm just happy to kind of see you kind of in the mix again with 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 our crew. But like yep. you said, you know, there's there's that web, you know, we yeah, just have web. these connections all over. So let's let's touch on, um, you know, becoming a, a child actor. I mean, where where did that even start? Where was the initial drive to, to start acting, getting involved? Man, I, again, that's like my parents. I was a Huggies baby. 18 months. I was, I was, I was acting. My parents got me started in that really young. I would literally go on audition after audition, after audition, memorizing pages on pages of script. Um, and my mom prepared, prepared me really well for that. She knew what it took at the time to make sure that I got the role. And I did a lot of stuff, worked with a lot of famous people, um, uh, all the way up until like 18. And then I thought it was time for me to take a break because I had worked my whole childhood and I missed some of the things that I couldn't have done at the time because I was acting like prom. I never got to go to prom, mm -hmm. which I really want to see my son be able to do and grow up and go through high school and stuff like that. So it had its ups and downs. I look back on the situation. I'm like, you know, everyone's going to have hindsight and be like, oh, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done mm -hmm. that. But it's always going to be 2020, but the benefit of it is, is obviously it made me very popular. The world that we live in now is a social media run world. So I have I, one thing Shuki Levy, the producer of Power Rangers said to us when I was doing Power Rangers is, yeah, it's not going to make you a lot of money because they weren't union at the time, but it will make you famous forever. And, he, and that stuck with me too. It really has. I've transitioned it. I've started a brand. I got another brand launching come at hopefully next month. It's just been, been pushed back my CBD line and stuff like that. So I'm huge on the recovery since I'm so into fitness and, and, you know, working out on a daily, keeping your mind and your body intact is your temple. So you got to make sure that that's always the first priority before anything. And <laughs> I go with the saying, like, if you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> so yeah. I don't want to be 40 and out of shape and have my son saying, dad, catch that ball. You're, you know, that's what happened when he was three. <laughs> I was a little out of shape. I was 270 pounds and I was just gassed. Um, so I hold on to those things and I cherish those moments and I just want to be a better me. So that's what it is. I work out night and day and I'm putting endless amount hours, hours amount for this fight and training my butt off and, and it's resonating in my kid. Cause I see him training his butt off. He, he, I'm right. leading by example for him and that's what I want to do. So. Absolutely. Well, you know, when, when, when your kids see you working out, eating healthy, taking care of your body, they're, they're going to learn. Dude, my how to sushi do that. bill is getting expensive now. Cause my son <laughs> likes sushi. <laughs> I was yeah. dreading that day. I was like, Oh, we can go to sushi. We keep it under a hundred bucks, but now it's over a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah. He's much, like, yeah, I need much. this role. I need that role. But you know, he's trying new stuff. He's, he's open to learning. And yeah, like you said, he is, he is seeing me train so hard. So I think it's pushing him harder. It's only going to define him as a better human being, keeping him, especially in martial arts throughout his whole childhood. Right. Absolutely. Talk about some of the highlights. You know, you, you, you brought up, you, you bring up Power Rangers casually. And, and I think that's where a lot of people get super excited. Like I said, I, I know I have some friends that are like, Oh my God, you got me Blake yeah. Foster Power well, Ranger. As you guys can uh, see, <laughs> I was the one and only kid Power Ranger. Um, I was thir 12 going on 13 years old. I had just came back from a tournament um, in Las Vegas and I took first place. And I think I took grand championship because I had a huge trophy that I brought to set. And it's actually the trophy that we hold up in the end of Power Rangers, which is funny. Um, but yeah, I came back and the way the way, how I no, there was no audition process for Power Rangers for me. I was filming an independent film at the time, and the producer was the director of Power Rangers, and I had no idea. But he I came back that, that weekend and I showed him my trophy, and he was like, Wait, what? You do karate? And I showed him some kicks, some flips. He was like, Wow, you're really good for a 12-year-old. And I think it just sparked in his head, hey, let's make this kid a Power Ranger. And uh he had that authority because he was the man of Power Rangers. And I didn't believe him. I was like, you're bullshitting. You're, you're pulling my leg. I'm sorry to say it, but I don't believe you because I was such a huge fan at 12. Literally, if I was in school and we were on hiatus and not filming, 
my normal routine was getting off the bus and running home to watch Power Rangers and play with the action figures. And it was cool because it was karate and I was so into it. One thing led to another. He had some Rangers come to set and it was the most popular ones. It was uh, Austin St. John, the Red Ranger, Jason, and it was Amy Jo Johnson, the Pink Ranger, Kimberly. And I, I saw them pull up in a black town car. I was off in the distance and I was like, who's pulling up to set in this nice new car? And they get out of the car and I'm like, in complete shock. I was like, I knew who it was immediately. They are very recognizable to me. I started running over there. Oh, actually, I had a golf cart. <laughs> they let me have my own golf cart on set. So I drove my <laughs> golf cart over there and I got to meet the red and pink ranger. And I was just like in complete starstruck mode. Even though I had been around other famous celebrities, these were my guys because I watched the show. So one thing led to another. I was at a table reading after filming that independent film. I was sitting in Valencia and I'm going through Power Rangers Turbo, the movie, which is the poster right here. And uh, I'm sitting at the table reading with my mom and I start seeing all the Rangers walk in and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like in shock. <laughs> the last person to walk in was Jason Frank, the Green Ranger, the most iconic, you know, the, the guy. And uh, got to meet him and one thing led to another. We started filming and they treated me really well, like a little bro. And I was, 12, I was 13 years old and I was having the time of my life. I was living every kid's dream. And, uh, you know, transition that to years, years, years later after numerous other films, numerous other television shows, I'm doing comic cons and I'm getting to go out and meet, sign autographs for my fans. And I got people waiting two hours in line just to meet me. And I'm again, I'm humbled. I'm like, wow, I didn't think that this would ever transition into this. And I got to travel the world. I got to meet so many cool people, so many cool fans that actually turned into friends. Um, just solid people that in this community and in that Ranger fandom and the, the whole universe of Power Rangers, there's a lot of good people in that universe. So I'm very grateful for them and I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. And um, like I said, I'm just, a, I'm a, I'm a humble guy. I know what it's like because I was such a huge fan. So I can relate really well to these fans because uh, I was a fan. So I know what it's like when you come up to meet me. So it's pretty cool. Well, you have you have a fan watching. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> yes, sir. Right? I'll bring it over. And, and, and here, here, he said he would wait in line for you. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we got a question from someone. Actually, he says, uh, this "Is a friend of mine actually was a, an old a old neighbor? Actually, Chris, uh, what what recovery advice would you have for someone who's older? He's not that old. He's probably only a couple years older than me uh, and new to jujitsu." What, what advice uh, what do you I've, have? What I've really, really had to take into effect with doing this stuff on the ground is that you just need to take the days. You need to recover. You, there's not really much you can do because jujitsu is totally a different ball game when you're on the ground and you're doing all these different moves, X guard, single legs, all this stuff, um, transitioning it. I think the best advice for me is because I'm such a big believer in CBD. I use CBD rubs all the time, and I also do um, uh, jacuzzi. Mr. Cox says you're not old, by the way. That's a good thing. <laughs> I am old. I'm 36. Yeah, bro, old, don't, even, you know what? don't even get started. Like, I feel like I'm in the best shape I've ever been at 36. So yeah, it feels good. Mean, well, we were talking about this earlier. I mean, you're, you're looking good. You're looking lean. You're down about 10% body fat at 217. you got a little more weight to cut. And we're going to talk about that fight just a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Cox, uh, ask old guys how to recover being 60 and roll in recovery. Yeah. Cold yeah. showers. Cold showers Shut up, bro. Sure. <laughs> See, we should have just had Mr. Cox come on as a third person. Yeah, we on the should. Video. We got to reschedule and do another one. With Mr. Cox. Good. So, you know, becoming becoming a Power Ranger, I mean, was that was it kind of <laughs> overwhelming for you a little bit? I mean, you know, it was a little bit of shell shock, culture shock. <laughs> I don't um, think it was well, to- overwhelming because I was just so used to acting. I was literally going from a film to a film. I had just finished Casper Meets Wendy, and then I transitioned into um, – um, Rusty a dog's tail, which was the independent. And then I literally transitioned from that into Power Rangers. So it was just so used to me being on set. I was already used to it. It was more of the, more of the point of me not acting like a kid and being like, oh my God, the Power Rangers, as opposed totally. to me actually knowing my role and having to produce my lines and show up. Yeah, it's it's kind of hard sometimes to not be uh, uh, a kid. <laughs> forgive me for the turn uh, a mark, right? In, in wrestling, you know, I've met several uh, pro wrestlers, and and you don't want to be that guy, like, and just totally, you know, fanboy out. 
Right. And, and you got you got to stay professional, right? So yeah, yeah. I can I, I definitely get that. I mean, that goes um, without anything because I've always been like, oh my god, I met so many famous people. Like for example, I just went to Runyon Canyon and I did a two mile hike the other day with my buddy Jerry Ford, which is Big Sean, the rapper, uh, personal trainer, and he was like, guess what? Sean's coming to work, work out with us, and I'm like. Uh, I've never met Big Sean before. And I'm just like, I listen to all his music. I'm like, wow, I'm not the fangirl, Jerry. He's like, talk, don't. So the whole time we're hiking, I wanted to get a photo with him, but I was just like, dude, you can't be that guy. First time me, hey, let me get a photo. So right, right, right. Totally, totally. Hey, so okay, let's let's talk about the fight. So you got this fight yeah. coming up. Uh, it was on again, off again, on again, off again, COVID hit, all this stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, you, your opponent, Michael Lasky, who was also uh, a power ranger at one time too, correct? 10 days. For 10 days. He was a 10 day ranger. All right. I never morphed. Right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I bust his chops all the time. <laughs> a lot of the fans bust his chops. Mike's a good guy. I don't have nothing against him. We, we, you know, when we first started this, we were, we, we were doing comic cons together and we were like, yo, what can we do to give the fans something more? Like, what can we do? And uh, he was doing his MMA thing. I think he's nine and three. He's got 12 fights in the ring. So um, he's, he's really good at what he does. And I was like, yo, it happened when he called out JDF. Something had happened. He had said, you know what? I'll fight the Green Ranger if the Green Ranger's down. And I took it kind of offensive because I worked with him. He was my teammate on Power Rangers Turbo. He was my Red Ranger. And I was like, dude, you can't be calling out my guy like that. Why don't you pick on somebody your own age? And that's how it happened two years ago. He was like, I'm down. Let's set it up. We'll fight. So... Mike's a smaller guy. Mike normally walks around probably like around 160. I know he fights at 155. He's fought at 175. He's making a big jump and transition to go to the big bro, big boys world and fight at 205 and fight me. So um, we've been working on it for years. Finally, after COVID, COVID hit and we were like, oh, we might as well just forget about it. Like it's, we, we, no one knew what was going on during COVID. Right. Um, and then we just stuck with it. We kept promoting it, kept announcing it, kept speaking with different amateur uh, companies. And we were like, dude, you know what? We're eventually, if we just keep nailing this hammer, we're going to get it. And we finally got it. Data set, locked in. Um, it was supposed to be originally in Las Vegas, Nevada under Tough Enough. It got changed because no more am I going amateur. In order for me to get a pay-per-view for the fight, I have to make my pro debut. So I'll be making my first pro, pro debut in the first fight of my life in the octagon. I'm going pro. <laughs> Um, I will be getting a pay-per-view through Blitz TV. It's at the Union Event Center. I hope everybody, my whole alliance is able to come. I want my support system there. Uh, it's his hometown. I'm going to walk out. They're going to boo me. So I need I need my team there. I need my, my camp there. I need everyone to show up for me. And if you can't, it's understandable. It's Utah. That's why there will be a pay-per-view for it. Um, so, yeah, we're stoked, man. September 18th, it's going down. The Red Ranger versus the Blue Ranger and... Little bangs going down. <laughs> the MMA gods are going to sprinkle the little fairy juice on people that put in the work. So, so I mean, I don't know. First pro fight ever. You know, you've been doing martial arts your whole life. You you have the size advantage, though. I mean, you definitely. I mean, I don't care if he if he walks at one sixty, he's still going to come in at least you know twenty pounds lighter than you. I mean, no, there's no way. he has to be two hundred five. He's going to, how is it? He's going to gain that weight. He's already gained the weight. He's already like 215 right now. He's on a weight cut now. So he okay. gained a massive amount of weight by eating pizza and beer and drinking. Uh, he got all bloated and now he's cutting weight to fight. So he's got, okay. he's got, all right. So it is, a, it, it is a catch weight at 205. Yeah, it's a catch weight at 205. And originally okay. when I took this fight, it's a good thing it didn't happen in July because I don't think I would have made 205 by July, you know? Um, so, it's just worked out in a good way. I'm 217 this morning, feeling really good. I don't really feel like I have to cut any weight up until maybe six weeks before the fight. So um, I'm dialed in right now. I'm, my diet's good. My training's solid. I'm training every single day for at least three, four hours. I'm training my butt off, and it's showing. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I went from a size 40 waist to a 36. I've lost four pant sizes. I'm in the best shape of my life. My speed is picked up. My endurance is there. I'm going five minute rounds already with a lot of pro fighters. I've sparred with Jared Papazian. He fought in the UFC. I mean, my coach Rob, he's fought 19 fights. He's pro. So a lot of these guys that I'm sparring with, they're like, dude, you're not even like an amateur. You're already kind of pro, bro. Like, 
So it all happened. And when he said, hey, we can't get the pay-per-view, I was like, well, then there's no point in fighting in Vegas because a lot of our fans are online. Wow, these people want to see this fight. So what do we got to do? And we reached out to another company, which picked us up, which is another company. It's called Steel Fist Fight Entertainment. They're based out of Utah. So that's where it's going down. That's who it's going down through. It is a main card event. There will be a belt for the world's toughest ranger. And I'm going to bring it home. And then any other ranger wants to step in line to try to take it from me, by all means, come on. Oh, no. He's calling it out. He's calling it out. Oh, I'm calling it out. I'm calling it out now. All right. I'm going in there with the mindset, you know, of just – I'm just staying positive. You know, it's my first fight in the octagon, but I've – I mean, I've had plenty of real fights, and I've had plenty of continuous sparring when I was growing up. So I think that I can hang with it. I think I know what it takes. Been training jujitsu. Mike's a wrestler, so I'm preparing for the ground. I've been training gi and no gi. I'm a white belt, <laughs> but I mean, you know, I'm I'm working at it. I'm training, and I might even compete at Jiu-Jitsu World League uh, coming up here next month myself. So, very nice. In this MMA world, I battled a couple injuries. I mean, it, it we're going 75 percent on Fridays. We're really hitting and really banging in there. Um, walked away with a couple black eyes, bloody noses, but that's just the name of the game. And um, I'm going full power for this, and I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop until I get the victory. Bring that belt back to the house, baby! <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it, love it. So September 18th, September 18th. I know, uh, I know. There's talks of uh, of several people going up, you know, in our in our group to go watch you. And yeah. and for those Mr. of us Cox, that don't, you better be there. I know you're going to be there. Better chime in and say, yes, I'm there right now, sir. <laughs> but, I think he um, already committed to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he committed down. to that a long time ago with me. So I just, you know, it's it's something that's it's new to me. And it's going to be a fu- it's going to be a fun adventure. And I'm going to take it with, like I said, all the gratitude and all the humbleness, humbleness, because it's either you're getting humbled or you're staying humbled. One of the two. Right. So let's talk about let's talk about what's next. You you mentioned you know potentially some other plans after this fight. You want to talk about that? Oh so, yeah, I do want to talk about it, and I'll plug some of that stuff. I mean, since I've been um, dibbling and dabbling, and you know meeting new people, and this MMA world has brought new things into my life. And right now, the the, the really big thing is celebrity boxing. All these YouTubers and TikTokers and famous people want to start doing the celebrity boxing. And I think it's shining some light on boxing. It's making boxing a little bit more prevalent, even though it's degrading it in a sense. But um, there's a big uh, celebrity boxing event that might be happening. Oh, here in Los Angeles, California, and it'll be at Staples Center. And I'm actually looking at um, being on the undercard for that. So that's somewhere probably around uh, April, May of next year. So um after this fight with mike i'll continue my training and i'll continue up my boxing and if the fight gets signed and i get to fight somebody famous it'll be under card for two really big huge basketball players um it's basketball <laughs> players stepping into boxing now so i'm just trying to stay you know focused and obviously i'm going to get back into the tongs i'm gonna start training over there i want to be a part of the studio i want the kids to you know see what i'm about and i haven't had that chance because i've been so busy literally every day i'm like i don't have no time not even for myself so right. After this fight, I am going to take a little bit of time off, get back to you know the swing of things. Jackson's a green belt, and he hasn't done anything in Tong Sudo because he's been so busy with me, but he is eventually going to get back over there. He is going to get his black belt, and I will sit on that panel, and I will judge him <laughs> based <laughs> off of his technique. But, um, yeah, it's just one thing that leads to another in life, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for every opportunity that I'm getting, and who knows where it goes. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, you know, it's, I, I agree with you in a lot of ways about the boxing, right? How, how, you know, I, I, I hate to admit, but man, I've, I've bought those fights cause I have two teenagers at home. So <laughs> it's like, dude, I'm 60 bucks to watch this. This is like I, terrible. I, I, cheat, I cheat a little bit. I do stream them. I do got a little <laughs> streaming service that I use, but, uh, I think that one thing that the people take for granted for the Paul brothers is that they think that they're celebrity boxers when they're really good boxers. They're training with real boxing people. So, and boxing's different than MMA. Everyone's like, oh, Tyrone Woodley's fighting Jake Paul. He's going to knock this guy out. I don't think so. Because I know Jake Paul's personal trainer. I know his personal guy too. And when these guys are setting up scheduled sessions for rounds, Jake Paul's getting dropped. So he's going at it. They're, they're really boxers. And I think Logan did really well against Floyd. I mean, you're fighting the best of the best, and you're able to put your hands on him, and you didn't get knocked down, even though there's a weight difference. It's, I think he did good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, 
but, but your point to it's brought a light to boxing again. I mean, I haven't watched boxing since Mike Tyson was in the ring. Exactly. Like, I mean, for me. I mean, like, I know we all ordered Mike Tyson's fight. Of course we did. <laughs> <laughs> of course we did. But I mean, back in his heyday, you know, that I, that kept me watching boxing. I love boxing. And then it just kind of, right. uh, but like you said, it, all this celebrity boxing has brought a little bit more light to it. Uh, a little good, a little bad, but there's still energy. I mean, hey, like you said, when you come out, whether they boo you or cheer you, what does it matter? They're paying attention to you, right? Exactly. Someone's <laughs> got to be the bad guy. Yeah. Someone's I love be being the bad, the bad guy. guy. Good publicity. <laughs> I mean, bad publicity is always sometimes good publicity. Yeah. So yep. people have their opinions and people can say what they want until they see it actually. And then they'll be like, oh, okay. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that Jake Paul got hand fed his first two opponents. He fought a basketball player that came out swinging for the fences. Didn't know what he was doing because but you know what? I know his personal assistant also. And he had a boxing camp. He was training boxing with the ropes. He, he was chattering with his head. He knew what he was supposed to do. And then he got what's called an adrenaline drop. His adrenaline was so high when he came out, he lost sight of everything. He didn't know what to do, and he didn't know how to keep that tunnel vision focused on what he was supposed to do. And then yep. another guy that Jake Paul fought, Ben Askren, yeah, that guy is a MMA guy. He got knocked out nasty by game bread, but he was way out of shape. Yeah. And that punch that he took, I was just like, oh, he took it for the – he just took that fight for the money. But so with this <laughs> fight with Woodley, we will see a good fight because Woodley is a stand-up fighter. That's oh, what his specialty Woodley, is. Andy, Woodley is an animal. Yeah, uh, Woodley's an animal. An animal. We'll see if that animalness can transition into boxing because, like I said, boxing, the coordination, the footwork, the slip in, the chatter, that's all different when it comes to knowing how to throw a punch and which way to throw the line of direction on a punch when you're boxing. So, for sure, we'll for see. Sure. But I still, yeah. I think if I had to bet, my money would be on Jake Paul. Ooh, all right, all right. So, uh, I know that my daughter is cheering big. You know, <laughs> that's that's who she's going for. Uh, I I I'm partial to Tyron Woodley just because he's an American top team. He was an American top team guy. Uh, yep. I had a long affiliation with American top team uh, back when R Ricardo Laboria was running that team, and I just I I've always kind of followed them. And and Tyron's a he, he's he's like I said he's a beast. So and yeah, we'll see we'll see if we can transition. Ball, it could be him, honestly, because his stand up yeah. so good. But yeah. he's just going to have to really dial in with the boxing because Jake's a boxer. Yeah. Jake's boxing yeah. every day. So, yep, yep. So we'll see how that goes, and 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 we'll look forward to seeing uh, seeing you on an undercard. Yeah, I'll uh, send you getting, some, uh, I'll send you some flyers and stuff too um, as we get closer, um, so that sure. way you can promote it and stuff like that, and see if anybody wants to come on out. Yeah, I know absolutely. it's a little bit of a drive, but the flight's only forty five minutes, so. Sure, sure. I'll be out there a week before the fight. You know, the altitude's a little different, so I'll have to get out there and run, run and do some pad work and stuff with some coaches out there. But, yeah, man, I'm looking forward to it. It's finally locked and loaded. The date is set, and there's no going back now. Michael Lassie's going to feel the wrath at 205. This ain't 175, little dog. <laughs> oh, boy. Here he goes. Here he goes. Light heavyweight. So Love it. I love it. I'm excited. I'm pumped. I'm pumped. I mean, I'm pumped I'll, I'll, I can't wait to watch you fight. So, hey, um, you, you, let's talk about some other projects you got going on. Uh, you got a couple of brands you're working on. Talk yep. about that a little bit before we close out. Yeah, well, I have my clothing line, hustlematters.shop. Uh, I started it with me and my best friend, Aaron Coney, probably like 10 years ago, which is something where we were like, yo, we're doing these comic cons. Let's have some merch. Let's have some sales. Let's do some stuff other than Power Rangers. And it, it really hit home. A lot of people started supporting us. We have a lot of huge celebrity influence deals with it. Um, and then it transitioned me and Aaron into our own company called Morph CBD. I'm huge on the CBD because I'm training so much. I have to have recovery. Um, and I, I believe in it 100%. It does help me with all my joints and all my, my fatigue and stuff like that. So um, CBD is coming out. I got a lot of Comic Cons that have been reaching out now that COVID's over. I'm going to get back out to the Comic Con world. I know I'm doing a show, a Comic Con, right after my fight the following weekend in West Virginia called Mountaineer Comic Con. My good buddy, Dave Playby, he's uh, throwing that Comic Con out in West Virginia. So if you're in the West Virginia area and you want to meet me, come on out. Um, other than that, I'm just staying busy, staying focused, trying to uh, keep my my mind on what's coming up first, and it's the fight. Um, so I've kind of had to put a little hold on the companies right now just because I'm so training and I'm so dedicated to this. But um, I wish I had an assistant. So if anybody wants to apply to be an assistant, <laughs> this might be a good way. Be a good way oh, no, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. But yeah, I just put a hold on a couple things because of the fight. And that's where I'm putting all my time and energy into. 
So, you know, you talk about all these different things, right? You got, you got the fight coming up, you got the brands, you got CBD stuff, uh, thinking of into the future, possibly boxing, you got the comic cons. How do you, how, how do you, how do you find that balance? Cause you know, there's a lot of people that are watching or will watch later that are like, dude, like, what does it take to be able to manage my time to get this stuff done? Cause you know, like you said, you're training a ton. It's a huge priority right now. Yeah. How do you prioritize that? So I probably, I, I have a schedule. My schedule is dialed in. I, I, before I, I never used Siri. I never said, Hey, schedule an appointment. But now my schedule is fully booked in the morning. I wake up, I, I do fasted cardio. I'll hit the gym in the morning, probably like seven, eight o'clock in the morning. And I'll do about two miles on the tread or two miles on the stairs. I'll have my first protein shake. I'll take my vitamins. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I'm in recovery mode after that workout. So I'm chilling for a little bit, doing stuff with the kids, whether it's swim lessons with Olivia or Jackson playing baseball, soccer, basketball, wrestling, whatever the case is that he's doing during the day. And then we're at the, we're at the studio from four to nine every single day. Jackson has two classes that he takes from four to four to six. I have two classes, six to seven, seven to seven thirty is sparring. And then no gi or gi is from eight to nine thirty. So I don't get out of the dojo every night until nine thirty at night. Mm. And um, I, I come home, I smash, smash on a meal real quick and either hit the jacuzzi or the sauna or the steam room, call it a night, wake up, do the same thing the next day. Consistency, right? Consistency, Consistency is, is the key to success. That's what I've realized. You know, I started off working out a long time ago, four or five years, <coughs> excuse me. And I didn't, <coughs> I didn't find that balance because it was either, oh, let's go out with my buddies and have a couple beers. It was a good week. I can go have a couple beers. But in reality, when I look at it now, mm -hmm. I set myself back that week. I would always just work out so hard. I wouldn't eat like a diet like how I was eating right now where I'm counting my macros and all my nutrients are in full, full att attack. I'm making sure my 300 grams of protein are in every single day. <clears throat> so I didn't have the balance that I thought I had. Until later in life when I started really realizing what it took to, to lose weight. And it's two simple ingredients. One is a calorie deficit. And two is don't stand at the fridge at the at end of the night and say, what do I need to put in my mouth? Because um, <laughs> I would have caught myself at the end of the night like, dang, I'm really hungry still. And that's like, honestly, people say it's not good to eat at nighttime. But what I've realized now is it's still good to eat if you're in a deficit. If you have not right consumed enough calories your body's not going to function properly if you're over your calories and you're in a surplus that's how you gain weight so people make make excuses they do what they do everybody lives their life you know enjoy it to the fullest but if you're really <laughs> going to dedicate yourself to something the consistency has to be there you have to Absolutely. do it for a solid anything in life you have to do it for a solid 60 days to see a change breaking a habit is the hardest thing especially in the world that we live in I mean, the fast foods on every corner. That's what they want you to eat. Mm -hmm. So you have to just, you have to say no. Sometimes you just have to focus and saying no is the hardest part, but if that's all mental, you get yes, the mental performance, you get the physical performance and then everything will fall in line. You'll be like, Whoa, I didn't know I could feel like this. And then it's just, yeah. it's just repetitive. And it's like, I don't even think about it now. Right. I don't remember the last time I had drove through a fast food restaurant unless it's in and out. So, <laughs> Gotta have in and out. That, that's the only you, thing I'll do. That's like a real burger. If right. I have a cheat day, I'll have an In-N-Out burger. <laughs> Love it. So. Hey, uh, real quick, you know, give a shout out to your team and, and all those people helping you out right now and just uh, mention some of those people that are inspiring you and, and continue to motivate you. Yeah, man, absolutely. So first off, for first and foremost, I want to thank you for having me on here. Um, Mr. Flame, I've known you since I was a kid. So um, it's just felt really welcoming and warming to know that I have you guys as my alliance. Chats with Karate, big shout out to Mr. Cox. Um, and... Uh, it's just been it's just been a hard transition because I want to be able to do something for everybody and I want to be everywhere I can be at one place, but it's impossible. Mm -hmm. So I just want everyone to know that I'm still I'm still with you. I'm still rocking with you guys um, and I'll be back at the studio. I love you guys with all my heart. And Jackson misses you guys. But I do have to give a big shout out to my dude, Rob Gooch over at G uh, Gooch Training Academy. He's really transitioned my fight style from a point fighter into an MMA guy and just the, the stuff that I've learned over there that I'll carry on throughout my entire fight career, no matter where it stops or ends. Um, and the people that I'm rolling with, everybody that's in my jujitsu class, my nogi class, everybody's opened me with what opening open arms and teaching me the stuff that I need to be taught. That way I know when I go to the ground, I know what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's just new levels and new openings for me. And I'm, like I said, I'm just taking it all in and 
-hmm. I'm trying to stay focused and I'm trying mm -hmm. to dedicate myself to this because one thing that I'm not going to do is go in there and lose. There's, it's just not an option. So I need to make sure that I'm prepared and I'm dialed in and that's it. So big shout out to everybody that's been a part of it. Everybody that's been with me from the very beginning, big shout out to my dude, Aaron Coney and hustle matters. Um, you know, I, I, I say hustle matters because that's the only thing that really matters in life. As long as you dedicate something to having a hustle, whether it's a, it's a hustle of you losing weight or a hustle of you gaining more money and becoming financially independent or whatever your hustle deep down inside is, keep striving for it because you will get there eventually. It just going to take time. I look back, I'm 36 now, but if I would have looked back 10 years ago and said, damn, I didn't do anything, I would have felt so like demolished inside. I look at it now and I'm like, you know what? Starting a brand out of nothing, turning it into something, it's possible. Mm -hmm. I see people that do cryptocurrency. People don't know where to start. All I would have to say is educate yourself. Pick up a book, read, do something. I picked up a book called The Warrior Kid by Jocko Willicks. It's on yep. Amazon. Yep. If you're a father and your son's going through jujitsu, mm -hmm. if, if you're a parent, a teacher, anything, that book should be implemented in every child's life because it teaches them good morals and good ethics. And it teaches them when you lose, you learn. It's not always losing. Mm -hmm. So... I pick up a book every now and then again. I read it to Jackson every night, especially since he's going through mm -hmm. jujitsu and it's just good bonding time and stuff like that. Trying to be the best father, the best motivation speaker, the best person I can be. And I'm me. I'm Blake Foster, y'all. I'm coming <laughs> home with the belt. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Hey, you you answered my question. My my last question was be, you know, what what advice do you do you have for people that are just getting started in whatever they're trying to do? And and you kind of answered that. Um, you know, I I really enjoyed this conversation and, and just getting to let people know Blake Foster outside of what maybe people might think you are or who right. who they think you are, right? right. And uh, I appreciate you being real and honest and uh, being humble enough to uh, talk about some of the things that are, that are a little bit harder. I actually never knew that you didn't pass your black belt test. And, and that's something that, yeah. you know, people think, oh, he didn't pass his black belt test. I mean, that's that's kind of a big deal. And, mm -hmm. and, and in, a, in a time in your life too, where yeah, that, yeah. that could have really changed you one way or the other. And you took it to another level of where it, it strengthened you. Yeah. And I think that that's what we need to remember. I mean, every, like you said, <laughs> it, 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 we're not always losing. We we're, we're learning and, mm -hmm. and, we just have to be able to accept that and keep, uh, keep training, keep growing, keep learning all the time. So, time. Hey, uh, I appreciate your time. I know you're busy and, and you got a lot going on. It, it took us a little while to get this on the books and get us scheduled in, but I'm going to go ahead and, and share this out again and, and it'll be on my YouTube channel guys. So master I know motivation, I don't do Facebook, but I'll, I'll share it too. Make yeah. sure you make it shareable. I'll share it. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I no, appreciate it. Facebook, but Instagram, thank you guys want to follow me on Instagram, Blake A. Foster. TikTok, Blake A. Foster. I'm not. I'm, I'm new to TikTok, also this generation. <laughs> but I did have a good time. I, I enjoy speaking with you, sir, and I enjoy everything that's going to come up. If you want to ever do this again, maybe we can get Mr. Cox on there. We can do a three way. Well, no, we, no we might have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, it's funny. A, a friend of mine uh, who actually kind of got started with a podcast at, at, at around the same time, um, Sifu Raphael, runs a, a podcast called the, the Coaching Call, and so now he's taken calls like this, but now he does like a roundtable. So I oh, kind of cool. like that idea. I think that would be cool to get three cool. or four of us on there and Let's and kind of chat. You know, I mean, for the most part, it's it's telling old stories and just having a good time catching up. I mean, that's what's 100%. so great about you know technology these days is that man, we can have this conversation. We don't have to drive out to the valley. You don't have to drive out here. We're just Even right here. We live like 15 minutes from each other. <laughs> right, right. But, but time, dude, time, yeah, time. because, you know, that, that's, that's what it is. So, hey, again, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Absolutely, Good luck sir. on the fight. We'll, we'll definitely be watching whether whether I'm able to be there in person or I host a party here at the school and let everybody, all there my students, go. watch you. Heck I think yeah. that would be super cool. So yeah, let uh, me know, too, if you ever want me to come out to the studio, say hi to the kids and stuff. I have no problem doing that. I would love that. I would love yeah. that. We'll have to set that up. So, yeah. all right. Hey, we'll, we'll catch up soon. And awesome. just want to remind everybody, uh, tune in every Monday, guys. Every Monday, having a conversation with different leaders uh, in our martial arts industry, uh, people that have motivated, inspired me in my life. I love sharing their stories. And Blake, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. I had fun. All right, guys. Peace Talk out. Soon. We'll see you next week on Monday. Peace. Take care. Bye-bye.